technical difficulties just now, but hopefully it's fine. Um, anyway, my name is Silas Richelson, and I'm going to talk about non-malleable commitments using Goldreich Levin list decoding. It's joint work with Ripple Goyal. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start with a slide that probably most people in here know. Um, semantic security is a definition of security for an encryption scheme. Um, roughly what it says is given a ciphertext the adversary doesn't know whether the message inside is a zero or a one. And sort of the, the reason I'm bringing this up is I want to make the point that the adversary in semantic security is passive. It's eavesdropping and it sits on the channel and it doesn't sort of, it, it listens to the message that's going on the wire, but it doesn't tamper in any way. <clears throat> non malleability is a security definition of Dolev, Dork, and Naor, and essentially you can think of it as semantic security, but with an active adversary. Um, so again, the, the adversary sits on the, on the channel, um, but now he's going to tamper the uh, ciphertext as it, as it goes from Alice to Bob. Okay, so the way that we model this is we have the adversary play in two executions of the protocol, one on the left where he receives um, an encryption of M, and one on the right where he sends an encryption of M prime. And the game here, the winning condition for the adversary is um, we say that the adversary wins if it can distinguish whether the encryption it received, um, whether the message inside was a zero or a one, if, given the message inside the commitment that um, it sends on the right. Okay, this is a stronger security notion than semantic security. In particular, um, it defends against the negation attack, where the adversary, sort of by tampering, is, a, is, in, um, is able to negate the plain text. So non malleability can, um, it's a security definition that can be applied to like numerous cryptographic primitives. We're going to, in this uh, work, be talking about non malleable commitments. So I want to tell you first what a commitment scheme is. Um, so it's a two party, two phase protocol. Roughly, you can think of it as implementing sort of th this it implements like a, a box with a lock on it. Okay, and the idea is that the, in the commit phase, Alice is going to put her message inside the box and lock it and send it to Bob. And then in the decommit phase, um, she sends the key. So it, for this, I guess, the decommit phase, you can think of it as she just sends all the randomness she used during the commit phase. Um, and yeah, the commit phase is going to hide her message. And the security that we want from this is two. We want two properties. We want binding, which says that um, once Alice puts her message inside the box and sends it, um, there's only one way she can open it. There's only one key that she can send to Bob that will open, open the lock. Um, and we want hiding, which says that until Alice sends the key to Bob, Alice doesn't, uh, Bob doesn't know what's inside. Okay, so formally that's, um, that's what we're talking about. Um, for non-malleable commitments, the way we model them um, is again, it's this adversary man in the middle Ex uh, experiment where he plays two protocol executions. On the left, he receives a commitment to M from Alice, and on the right, he sends a commitment to M prime to Bob. And the security intuition we're going for is um, is that M prime doesn't depend on M. The message on the right is independent from the message on the left. Um, okay, so. There are tons of applications of non malleable commitments. Around crypto, there are a lot of basic, um, well, it's been around for a long time, and numerous applications have been found. Applications to uh, protocol composition, MPC, other non malleable primitives, um, authentication, position based crypto, like tamper and leakage resilience, um, numerous applications. More recently, um, and kind of excitingly, there have been applications elsewhere um, in TCS. So there are some applications to hardness amplification, uh, recent constructions of pseudo-randomness use ideas from non-malleability. Um, so yeah, it's a really fundamental primitive, what we're talking about here. And there's a lot of prior work um, that's gone into building non-malleable commitments. The main, um, sort of the main efficiency measure we use to, to, um, to, to measure non-malleable commitments is round complexity. And so you're trying to design protocols that have decreasing uh, number of rounds. And yeah, there's been prior work going back to the early 90s. Um, and <clears throat> sort of roughly, if you look, if you looked five years ago at what the situation was, it was the following. Um, we had we had four round constructions of non-malleable commitment. 
assuming um, that one way functions exist. And we had a lower bound that said um, you can't do better than three unless you want to make use of um, super polynomial hardness assumptions. Okay, so, so five years ago we were, we were pretty much at this threshold. We had an upper bound of four, we had a lower bound that said you couldn't get less than three. Um, and, and a question was could you get three? Um, since then, two works have gotten three round uh, non malleable commitments um, using one uses quasi polynomial hard one way functions and one uses uh, number theoretic assumptions such as DDH. Um, there's some really nice works getting two round uh, non malleable commitments, so bypassing this lower bound, making use of sub exponential hardness. Um, and there are other nice works that get um, like round efficient non-malleable commitments that have stronger notions of non-malleability that are more useful in, in some of the applications I said. Um, but to summarize, before sort of this work, there was no three-round protocol that was just based on like normal polynomial hard one-way functions. So in, in particular, any, uh, any protocol that had fewer than four rounds either made use of a um, super polynomial hardness assumption or some number theoretic assumption. So the main result of this work is we show that three round non-malleable ex uh, non commitment exists based on normal polynomial hard one-way functions, um, except there we're assuming one-to-one one-way functions. Okay, so we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna assume that the functions, one-way functions are one-to-one, one one, but the, we're, we're not making any sort of super polynomial hardness assumption about them. <clears throat> okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm more or less going to be, be describing various protocols and building up to sort of the final construction. Um, and actually from here on out, we're not really going to be talking about non-malleability anymore, non-malleable commitments. Sort of the arc of non-malleable commitments has gotten so specific that the bottleneck really lies within sort of the subroutines in the commitments. So we're going to sort of zero in and focus on those. Um, but before I do, I just want to sort of, uh, sort of justify it a little bit. Um, so this is the, the man in the middle experiment when we're talking about a three round commitment scheme. So sort of on the left you have A, B, C, those are the rounds, on the right you have A prime, B prime, C prime. Um, and the man in the middle is the adversary and he gets to control when, sort of in what order the messages are sent. And if you're talking about a three round scheme, there are two options for him. There's the synchronizing man in the middle where the order goes like this. Okay, so he plays sort of the left side and the right side in sync. And then there's the sequential man in the middle where he plays the left side and then the right side. Okay, and roughly speaking, you have to treat these two men in the middle differently. You have to build a protocol and then you have to sort of show that if the man in the middle is of the first type, then you have security against him because of X, Y, and Z. And if he's of the second type, you have security of him for different reasons. Okay, and if we look at the prior work, um, sort of, the, the main component of this work with uh, Vipul and Umkant is, um, is already non-malleable against a synchronizing man in the middle using nothing fancy, using just one-to-one one-way functions, no extra super polynomial hardness. Okay, so really the bottleneck occurs at this sequential man in the middle. Okay, and um, so the main component of that, of that work gave no security against the sequential man in the middle. You can sort of enhance the protocol, the final protocol gets security, um, but this is where the quasi-polynomial hardness assumption is made. Um, and so, so really our focus is going to be on the sequential man in the middle um, to, get rid of that, uh, to get rid of that extra assumption. Um, okay, so I want to sort of jump to um, the main technique for how do you prove non-malleability against the sequential man in the middle, because that's what we're going to sort of be doing from here on out. Um, and the key is, is a notion of extractability for commitments. Okay, so what's, a, what's an extractable commitment um, or what's an extractor for a commitment scheme? Well, it's, a, um, it's an algorithm that runs the, sort of gets Oracle access to Alice and um, given a commitment plus the Oracle access to Alice, it's gonna extract the committed value inside. Okay, so visually, if you're looking at a three round scheme, what's happening is that the extractor is gonna take ABC as input and that's gonna rewind and send a new capital B, get a new capital C, and then it's gonna somehow recover M from these five values that it has. Okay, that's what we mean when we say, um, when we're talking about an extractor. 
And the theorem, sort of the sweeping, very easy theorem, is that any extractable commitment is already automatically non-malleable against a sequential man in the middle. Okay, it's easy to see. Roughly, the intuition is that sort of e extraction um, corresponds to knowledge. And so the idea is that if you can extract M prime from, from the man in the middle, then the man in the middle knows M prime, and therefore M prime can't depend on M because that would break hiding. M is computationally hidden from M, from the man in the middle. Okay, and if you want to be formal, you can, you know, uh, build a reduction out of this. The way it would work is you would get a commitment to either zero or one from outside. You would sort of spawn a copy of the man in the middle. You'd run the right execution. You'd get some Z prime. You'd extract. You'd get M prime. And then you'd use the non-malleable distinguisher to break hiding. Okay, so back to this picture. So we're sort of stuck at this sequential man in the middle. Um, and our plan is pretty clear. We need to build a three-round extractable commitment in order to get non-malleability against, um, against this sequential man in the middle. Um, so, okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, I want to sort of, before I get into it, I want to convince you that it's a hard problem. So I want to sort of go through like an example of what, you know, an attempt, I guess, of an extractable commitment scheme. And I'll tell you why it doesn't work. Um, so here's like an example, okay. So we have some M we're going to commit to. Let's break it into shares, R0 and R1. Um, they're secret shares, so they XOR to M, but otherwise they're random. And let's do this many times. So we get, let's say, N copies of two shares, R01, R11, all the way through R0 and R1N, and we commit to all of them. Then Bob's going to sort of select one uh, share from each pair, and we'll open the corresponding share. And that's our commitment scheme. Um, okay, so it's, it's pretty straightforward to prove that this is hiding and binding, no problem. Um, for extraction, what you might expect is you'd be like, okay, we can build an extractor that's going to rewind, it'll send, you know, B prime one through B prime n, ask for new, uh, for new, uh, new shares, like one new share from each pair, and for some i, you're going to get two shares from, you're going to get both basically um, R i, R zero i and R one i, and that's your extraction. Once you have that, sorry, once you have that, you just output the XOR and you say, thank you very much, I extracted. Okay, and you're right. However, um, there's a problem. The problem is that the adversary, or, or sorry, Alice might um, prevent you from extracting both shares from every single pair. Okay, so for example, she might just automatically abort whenever B1 equals one. And so this guarantees you'll never be able to extract both shares from the first pair. And so you'll always be sort of in this position where you have to guess whether the first pair XORs to M or it XORs to something that's wrong. Okay, and in the first case, you should, your extra, the committed value should be M, and in the second case, the committed value is bot, and you can't do anything better than guess. Because you can't, she's never gonna open for you um, the, the first share of the first pair. Okay, and so, this is a problem. Problems of this type are sort of studied. They're called over or under extraction, depending on you know, the specifics. Um, and it's known that, that commitment schemes with this problem are not sufficient for non-malleability. You can build sort of um, behaviors of the man in the middle that you can't really, you can't extract from, and it's a, it's a problem for the proof of non-malleability. Okay? Um, so now, before I get into our, our actual protocol, I wanna sort of, uh, um, I want to make a disclaimer. So the protocol we're about to see is not actually extractable. We achieve something weaker. It's still sufficient for non-malleability. But, um, and also it's a little bit technical, so I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just not going to get into it in this talk. Um, but if you're interested in sort of these like old school protocol type problems, this is a really nice one. Trying to construct three round extractable commitment. Um, like full extractable commitment from one-way functions or one-to-one one-way functions, it's still open and it's a nice problem. And it would simplify the proof of non-malleability quite a bit. We have to do a bit of work to get from this notion that we achieved to, to the full non-malleability. Okay, but from here on, I'm gonna ignore the fact that we don't get full extraction and I'm just gonna, um, I'm just not gonna get into this. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, so I want to start sort of with, I guess, the reason that we're using a one-to-one one-way function instead of just a normal one-way function. And the answer is um, we're going to basically 
build on top of Blum's bit commitment. So I want to start by, by introducing, introducing Blum's bit commitment. Um, and actually, I won't introduce it here. Um, I'll introduce it in a couple slides. But I will say that the, uh, the, the proof of binding uses the fact that f is 1 to 1. And the proof of hiding is via this gold right Levin theorem. Uh, it's a really nice argument. And sort of we'll need a couple of facts from uh, artifacts from the gold right Levin theorem uh, for our main protocol. Um, and so I want to sort of give a slide to the goldberg levin theorem to, to justify the, or to, to describe those artifacts. Um, so the core of the goldberg levin theorem is this like prediction implies inversion algorithm. Um, and it says basically if you have a predictor that can predict an inner product uh, with some secret value x, you can use the predictor to reconstruct x. And the way it works is you look at the output of the predictor on every string in this sort of special set called the goldberg levin set. Um, and sort of from a technical perspective, it's really critical that the elements of this Goldreich Levin set are pairwise independent. OK, but I'm not going to um, spend more time on this. So protocol number one is really just an interactive version of Blum's bit commitment. So what you do, and, and this isn't our actual protocol, but this is like a first try, is you send f of x in the first round. Um, Bob sends r in the second round. And Alice sends the inner products x and r plus the message in the third round. And um, so, so this scheme has a working extraction proof. So the rough idea is you'll, you'll rewind um, and you'll send different challenges. And specifically, you'll send different challenges. Um, the challenges you send will be sort of different strings in the Goldreich Levin set. Um, and you'll. Uh, You'll essentially run the Goldreich Levin proof machinery, um, and you'll recover uh, x, and that's the that's the extraction. Um, the hiding proof doesn't work. Um, essentially, the problem is that um, f of x is just a one-way function, so it might leak sort of a bit of x. And if the adversary knows what the what bit it leaks, it can just query that specific r, and and it can recover m. Um, so the summary here is, is basically that in the, in the non-interactive version, A controls R, and so the scheme is hiding, but it's not extractable. In this scheme that's here, B controls R, and so it's extractable, but it's not hiding. And so the main idea is you need to sort of somehow share the control of R um, between the two parties in such a way that the proof will go through. And sort of I don't have enough time to go through it, so I'm going to skip. Um, you make some use of coin flipping and um, and uh, yeah, so I, I don't have time to go through these uh, specific protocols, um, but using sort of coin flipping and some sort of special proofs and uh, um, sorry, this is where I wanted to get to. Uh, no, this is where I wanted to get to. So using some coin flipping and some special proofs, you can get to a point where essentially you commit to a bunch of strings in the first round. Um, and then in the third round, you prove sort of that the string you're using, R, is uh, one of the strings you committed to. OK, and this has some sort of, it's like a coin flipping protocol. Um, and it has some uh, elements of the previous scheme we saw. Um, and in particular, extraction is still going to work as long as this number k is, uh, is like small enough. Um, hiding works as long as k is roughly as big enough. And so this is sort of the main sort of point that you get to if you try like basic coin flipping. And it's apparently a conflict because um, the sort of lower bound you require on k is, uh, can be made to be larger than the, the upper bound you require on k. And so this is. Um, so the, I guess the main, like if you had to say technique, um, is you choose k dynamically. So you choose sort of the number of commitments dynamically um, via a protocol that has security properties that let sort of both sides of the proof go through. Um, and yeah, so um, I think I said it. Yeah, so the, the sort of the, the final protocol, it, sorry. Yeah, last slide. So the, the final protocol is uh, um, 
is going to be secure because extraction is going to work because uh, sort of even if A cheats during this K gener generation subroutine, K is going to be uh, small. And hiding is going to work because there, there's a simulator that can arrange K to be large enough. <coughs> OK, so summary, we get non-mallow commitments with optimal rounds, assuming polynomial hard one-way functions, one-to-one one-way functions. Um, and constructing just vanilla extractable commitment is still open. I think it's a nice problem. And thank you very much. Yeah. Um, which proofs? The. Yeah, I totally skipped it. Uh, so the pi-i's are just witness indistinguishable proofs, so you can build them out of one to one functions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. So, essentially, the gap is that. Um, so we're extracting here using the Goldreich-Levin sort of technique, and so there's sort of an always a strategy that Alice can do that um, that makes her extraction fail. Namely, she can just send a random bit in the third message. And with probability one half, she'll be committing to zero, one half committing to one. But you'll never be able to extract because um, the Goldreich-Levin theorem requires some sort of non-negligible advantage. And um, so essentially, the gap is the following. We achieve um, what we call distributional extraction, where we're, we're, we're extracting the distribution that Alice is committing to perfectly. But on a, a specific instance of like, Here's a commitment scheme, and then run the extractor. We might get the wrong answer, but if you if you if you view that as an experiment and you repeatedly run it, we'll get the exact same distribution as the distribution that Alice is committing to. Yeah. 